You're watching Las Vegas One, your 24-hour news source. This weekend in business Las Vegas, there's nothing simply ordinary about the marketing campaign for one local mixed-use development. We'll hear from one of the people behind Sullivan Square. Plus, a national study says Southern Nevada's property values are way out of whack. And are Spanish-speaking customers getting a fair break from local auto dealers in business Las Vegas? Next. This is In Business Las Vegas with your host, Jeff Gillen. And hello everybody, I'm Jeff Gillen. Welcome to this edition of In Business Las Vegas, your source for the top business news of the week. From the resources of the Las Vegas Sun, Channel 8 Eyewitness News and In Business Las Vegas. Let's take a look right now at our top stories. With Latinos making up a quarter of our valley's population, are local companies fulfilling their obligation to their Hispanic speaking customers? A local man claims he was duped by a Las Vegas car dealership, but as Data Gentry reports, the trouble could be in the translation. When Cesar Perez bought a van recently at People's Kia, he expected to pay roughly the price he says he was originally quoted. 23,000. And how much did your paperwork end up saying? Uh, 40000 So after a weekend of mulling over the paperwork, Perez returned the van to what he calls an unsympathetic dealer. They would say, uh, I don't care, it's, it's not my problem. With no rescission period on auto purchases, the dealer had no obligation to accept the vehicle. But under a state law, Perez may have a case. I tell they, uh, uh, give me the papers in Spanish or uh, send somebody uh, speak Spanish for translate me and they don't hear me nothing. State law requires the commissioner of financial institutions to make applications for credit and sales contracts available in Spanish, but available to whom and at what point? People's Kia refused to talk to us on camera, but off camera the owner told us he'll make anything available in Spanish to his Hispanic speaking customers. All they have to do, he says, is ask. But Perez thinks expecting customers, many already intimidated by the process, to ask for the forms in Spanish is expecting too much. And he says, did him no good. Dana Gentry in business, Las Vegas. And joining me right now to talk more about the obligations of businesses to their Hispanic speaking customers is Lee Jones. She works with Clark County Legal Services as a consumer attorney. Welcome. Thank you for coming in. You know the story that we just saw of that gentleman. Is that the rule or the exception uh, out there in, in Clark County, do you think? Uh, the rule that... Uh, I mean, do, do you get a lot of cases like that where businesses have not translated for customers? I mean, is that an exception or do you see a lot of that out here? Um, I don't really see a lot of it. I know that there, there's a... And I think the reason is that the Spanish-speaking customers may not know that they're entitled to, to view a, uh, the contract right. written in Spanish. Um, but we really don't see a lot of it. What, what, let's talk about the law. Mm -hmm. What does the law require? Uh, the law requires that if a dealership uh, advertises that it speaks Spanish or tr conducts a trans transaction with a customer in Spanish, that upon the customer's request, the dealership has to provide the forms in Spanish to the customer so that the customer can review mm -hmm. uh, can review the forms in Spanish. It, does it require too much of the customer? I mean, who, uh, the burden is on whom here? Is it on the customer to, to uh, request, uh, look, I need to see something in Spanish, understand it, or is the burden on the business to provide it? The burden is on the customer to request it. If the customer doesn't request it, the business is under no obligation to provide those forms written who, in Spanish. Do, is state law tough enough in this regard? I mean, who do you think the burden should be on? Um, I don't think it is tough enough, really. Um, mm. the, the, the law seems pretty weak um, in terms of its protection of Spanish customers. Um, the burden should be on the business to actually, if it conducts the transaction in Spanish, to go ahead and provide the, the, the forms in Spanish. So once again, if, if I am a Spanish-speaking customer and I go into a business, um, I am under law, uh, in, I don't understand the forms, that mm -hmm. business has to give me either a form in Spanish or get me a, a, somebody to translate. Uh, no, the law doesn't require that the, if the business doesn't have anyone that speaks only Spanish, then the business does not have to so provide. only if you ask. Only if you ask. Right. And only if the business basically um, 
presents itself as a business that also speaks Spanish and transacts uh, or conducts transactions with their customers in Spanish. Only then do they have to even provide the forms if, if they are asked for. Well, that's an interesting issue. We appreciate mm -hmm. your perspective on mm -hmm. it. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. A proposed Henderson retail project now on hold. JNF Land Company, a subsidiary of Juliet Properties, wants to build a retail complex on the northwest corner of Lake Mead Parkway and Water Street next to four industrial plants. The Henderson City Council was scheduled to vote on the project June 20th, but the developer now wants to delay that vote. JNF land executives say they want to give the city more time to study the project's plans. The city, meanwhile, wants to look at the potential health risks the chemical plants pose to future shoppers. The delay could last up to six months. The city, or the site, excuse me, was formally proposed for a Kmart, but that plan was withdrawn. When in business, Las Vegas returns, the county recorder turns herself in on charges of selling real estate records. Plus, a new study says Las Vegas home prices are riding on top of a great big bubble. We'll ask an expert when in business returns. If you're a mover or a shaker in Las Vegas, there's a newscast designed specifically for you. It's called News One, and you'll find it only on Las Vegas One. News One is smart news for the informed viewer. The only newscast for the high rollers of the local business scene in Southern Nevada. If you want to stay number one, watch News One. Jeff Gillen hosts News One, weeknights at 9 on Cox Channel 19. We start with breaking news at 4.30. Any place. Every time. When breaking news happens in Southern Nevada. It's not just news. That school bus shooting that happened near I-15. It's Channel 8 Eyewitness News. And welcome back, embattled county recorder Fran Dean free on $20,000 bail. Dean appeared in court Friday morning, one day after she turned herself into police. She's been charged with 19 counts of fraud and theft for allegedly selling public documents to private developers and pocketing thousands in cash. Dean has maintained her innocence since Metro raided her office in March. Neither Dean nor her attorney commented on the charges as they left the courthouse Friday. We'll be happy to talk to you when the time is right. Right now, it's not that time. Dean's preliminary hearing set for July 5th. The Bureau of Land Management is denying claims it's giving a sweetheart deal to local, local developer Randy Black Jr. The Review Journal reports the BLM plans to sell a near one acre parcel of land directly to Black for $546,000. That land is located on Durango Drive near Azure, just south of the 215 Beltway. It sits adjacent to nearby parcels, also owned by Black. Officials from the BLM, which traditionally auctions its land to developers, say they made an exception for Black because they believe nobody else would benefit from owning that property. Critics say the land is worth more than the price the BLM is offering and that Black is getting a big bargain. The sale is expected to go through next month. Valley home prices have soared, but are they in for a crash landing? According to a new study out this week, homes in 71 U.S. cities are extremely overvalued. Now, here in Las Vegas, the study says home prices are overvalued by a whopping 42 percent. Channel 8's Ted Florent said how rising home prices are affecting both real estate agents and buyers. Okay, come on in here. Wow. Richard Munchensky is looking for the perfect home. We asked him how many homes he's looked at. He's lost count. Close to 50, 30. Richard says he's not picky. It's just he makes your average salary in Las Vegas. And with homes he's been seeing, he just can't afford it. Oh man, it's crazy. It's like you're looking at one home and it's like they want $400,000 for that and you're looking at another home and it's just for what you're getting and from what I'm used to seeing where I'm from, it doesn't seem like it's worth it. Richard may not be the only one. That's because a study found in the USA Today says Las Vegas is among 71 other housing markets that are way overpriced. Oh, <laughs> tragic. <laughs> That's Try being a realtor. Joanne Ahern has seen client after client frustrated at Las Vegas's huge home prices. The prices for what we're seeing 
1,800 square feet with absolutely no yard whatsoever for 320. My buyer didn't even get out of the car yesterday at some of the homes. Other real estate agents we talked to say finally some of their sellers have given in. Sick of nobody buying their homes, houses like these dropped their prices nearly $15,000 after months of vacancy. Richard says he may have to say goodbye to that dream home and get one he can afford. Alrighty. And for Joanne, no buyers today. There we go. Ted Florendo, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. And I'm joined right now by Debbie Huber. She is the president of the Nevada State Appraisal Commission. She's also the owner of Huber Appraisal Incorporated. Welcome. Thank you for coming on our program. Thank do you, you buy the conclusions of that study that we are 42% overvalued? No, I do not. Why not? I feel that uh, they're, in my work and the work of the people on my team at, at the office, uh, by the way, I do need to disclose that my opinions are my opinions personally and do not reflect on those of the commission. Sure, okay. Uh, but in working day to day through this market, I'm still seeing that properties that are priced correctly are still selling within about a two month period which tells me mm -hmm. that there still is a balance in supply and demand for the properties that are priced well. Are our appraisals here, are they, are they and I'm playing devil's advocate here, are they really based on sound fundamentals or is this really a function of the frenzy that's been driving the market here? There is a, some uh, uncertainty in our market right now as a result of the frenzy that we had in 2004 and 5. There are certain pockets where there have been some corrections in pricing, but overall the market is still, there's very high demand for homes and we still are, are seeing a lot of sales in the well, community. How do you as an appraiser account for that frenzy? I mean, how does that work into the worksheet here? And, and, and do you make a conscious effort to try to separate that from your calculations? Yes, you do need to look at what's happening now. And to do a very, very good appraisal, you not only need to look at what's happening now, but equate what's happening now to what you see may be happening in the next few months to make sure that you're providing a, a very, mm -hmm. very good opinion of value. Let me ask you this question. Uh, let's talk about real estate agents. I mean, how, how much are they, and mortgage brokers for that, for that uh, uh, you know, for that matter, how much are they responsible for this, this, this run up in the sense that do you see real estate agents dissuading sellers for, from, from lowering prices to, to perhaps better reflect market conditions? Persuading them not to lower yeah, prices? Yeah, I mean, I I in other words, do you think real estate agents are trying to keep prices up here? Not at extent? all. No? The real estate agents are trying to educate the public, in my opinion, on what is happening in our market. And um, a good agent is going to, going to counsel someone in the proper fashion to accomplish their goal. And goal right. being the homeowner's right. goal or the buyer's goal. I know that, you know, uh, appraisers always say, look, we do base this on sound market fundamentals. But let me ask you this. I mean, w when you had such huge investor activity coming in here, and that was really what blew this market through the roof, all the investors coming in. I mean, how can that be sound market fundamentals when you've got this huge external influence coming in here and just uh, throwing prices in, into a frenzy? I mean, doesn't that mean that we're kind of on shaky ground here? The frenzy continued as we could keep up with it. Yeah. And then we could no longer keep up with that particular pace, so the market started correcting itself. And so um, I think part of the frenzy was people feeding on the fact that for so many years before that, we didn't have a whole lot of really rapid or good solid appreciation in this community. Uh, based on the amount of growth that we were getting. So part of that frenzy was, was a portion of it, I think, was attributed mm -hmm. to the fact that we didn't have appreciation to begin with to how, keep up. How worried are you on people who took out loans based on these higher values who, who, who may now be over encumbered? Is that a concern for you? It, it is a concern. Yeah. It is a concern and it is a concern on the type of loans uh, that perhaps they obtained uh, of the 100 percent or even right. I've heard of 125 percent financing. It is a concern and something that we do need to watch. Uh, I mean you watch the market every day. What's your assessment of what this market's going to be doing in the next six months do you think? I'm hopeful and I, I believe that our saturation uh, as far as the amount of listings that are on the market, I'm hopeful that we're close to the saturation point to where uh, sometime in the very near future, hopefully within the next three months, we will see uh, uh, a um, it'll slow down as far as the number of listings that are coming mm -hmm. out on the market. Some people who can will pull their homes off the market because of the situation that's going on and I think we'll start seeing that number of listings start declining. If that listing number stays high, is that a sign of trouble do you think? 
No, I don't, because we still have minimum 4,000, uh, sometimes five, 6,000 residents moving here net a month. And we still are creating jobs to provide uh, jobs to those people coming into mm -hmm. town. And I still see that, that we should be fine. In and be because of that factor and because of the land constraints, are we fairly protected, do you think, than the other 70 cities in that study? We have always been somewhat isolated here in Las yeah. Vegas. We have a lot of different factors going on right. in this community that we have nowhere else. So I there is some isolation there. I, I could keep talking, but we're out of time. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it Thank very you, much. Thank you, Jeff. When in Business Las Vegas returns, a new ad campaign leaves much to the imagination, like what is it selling? And later, is America's image abroad suffering? The travel industry says this country needs a makeover. Welcome back, I'm Jeff Gillen. You've seen the ads, but you may have no idea what they're talking about. We get asked about trends all the time. And I have a saying, trends are for followers, not for leaders. So we don't, we don't follow trends, we create them. Well, that's an ad for Sullivan Square, the new urban village plan for 215 in Durango. The ads promise a different type of development that recreates the urban ethic of back east. And joining me right now is Paul Chung, the project manager of Sullivan Square. He's with developer Glenn Smith. And Glenn, welcome. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Um, why this kind of campaign? You know, we really did the first step in seeing who our buyer is going to be. And we realized that in order to attract the community we wanted, our buyer would have to be primary residents, people who would live in this community. And so that really affected how we chose the campaign. Mm -hmm. And we really decided to say, what's going to attract someone who's moved to Vegas or who lives here and who's going to live here uh, full time? And that's a little bit different than the folks who might be attracted to some of the strip products. Sounds to me like you're really uh, banking on somebody who moved here from back east. I mean, this is really kind of an eastern kind of project. You, got you know what? Um, the Sullivan Square, the name came from Lewis Sullivan, and he was a turn of the century architect, uh, right. influenced Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, when we looked around at some of the architecture, uh, he influenced architecture not only across the United States, but all over the world. So really, it was somewhat from the East Coast. Also, if you look at San Francisco after the uh, fire, sure. it was a lot of things are like that. Uh, just one more thing on the ad. I mean, you see so many ads here that, that rely on sex to sell or that sizzle to sell the condo thing. Obviously, that's not what you folks are doing yeah. here. Was this your way to kind of break through the clutter? That's exactly our way to break through the clutter. We did an interesting exercise in our offices and we put up all the ads, print ads from all the other campaigns and it was amazing. You couldn't tell the difference amongst them. Mm -hmm. uh, they were able to put a naked woman in a martini glass uh, somewhere in the ad, which is great. For us, we realized that we wanted to break through and send our message home, but we also realized that our buyer, they know where the strip is. They don't need the strip to be sold as an amenity. Right. So you no longer have to say, hey, look, the strip is in your backyard. You know, we live here, we work here, we know how to avoid the traffic. Well, let me, let me ask you about this, because you, you're banking on primary residents. Um, a lot of other projects here are not banking on primary residents. They're looking for second home buyers and that mm -hmm. type of thing. I mean, is there a market for, because uh, this is a big project you've got on the drawing board there. Um, there's enough people out there who want primary residence in that, in that kind of development in that part of the valley. There is. I think what, the way we look at things is if you come to the valley and you're looking for single family homes, you have a lot of variety and a lot of options. Right. If you're looking truly at kind of mixed use urban uh, high density living, which again is available and is quite ordinary in other parts of the country, you don't have that option in Vegas. And so of the people who are moving here every month, we really believe that having this option is attractive to people. What about price point? What are, you, what are you looking at here, do you think? No, price point, so we're starting our first tower at about $280,000 and going on up. And I think for us, again, you're really shooting for the folks, the uh, urban professional, mm -hmm. in the age range of from the, uh, the young professional to the person who is downsizing and looking for uh, moving in from another hey, state. Final question, have you done this in other cities? Uh, Glenn Smith and Glenn has done uh, other developments, but not this is our first mixed-use project here in, in Vegas. We will be watching it with interest. Thank you for explaining the advertising. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. When in Business Las Vegas returns, a new company aims to give local landscapers a run for their money. We'll be right back.
The Valley tourism held steady in April. That's according to the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. The LVCVA reports more than 3.3 million people traveled to Las Vegas in April. That's less than a percent higher than last year's mark in the second straight month. Visitation rose by less than 1% from the year before. So far this year, 12.8 million people have visited Las Vegas. That's up about 1.5% from the same time last year. A new deal will boost the number of visitors from South Korea. Korean Airlines will begin offering non-stops from Seoul to Las Vegas in September. The airline will carry roughly 300 passengers to Las Vegas three times a week. Local tourism officials say the new service will increase visitation from South Korea by 50 percent. The LVCVA says about 200,000 South Koreans visit Las Vegas each year. The federal government needs to do more to promote tourism from foreign visitors, according to one travel industry group. The Travel Industry Association of America wants the federal government to launch a global marketing campaign. Association President Roger Dow says America's image overseas is suffering due to sinking support of the U.S.-led war in Iraq. A Pew study of 14 foreign nations shows fewer people have favorable opinions of the U.S. than they did a year ago. Only those polled in Great Britain, Pakistan and China say they have a more favorable opinion of the U.S. since last year. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority says that so far it has not seen an impact on foreign tourism to Las Vegas. LVCVA numbers show an increase in foreign visitors dating back to 2002. A long-time strip casino is about to close. It's moving its workers to other properties. The Klondike will close its doors June 30th after nearly half a century in business. Current workers at that casino have the opportunity to transfer to a second Klondike property near Boulder Highway and Sunset. Longtime Klondike owner John Woodrum sold the property to a Florida-based company that plans to convert it into a high-rise hotel condo. Well, don't expect many Valley employers to increase their payrolls in the third quarter. Only 30 percent of Las Vegas companies say they plan to hire more workers, according to a new survey by Manpower Incorporated. That is down from 33 percent in the second quarter. 60 percent say they plan to maintain current staffing, while 10 percent say they plan to reduce their payrolls. Manpower says the hospitality, construction and convention industries will hire the most workers in the third quarter. Question, is the lunch hour going the way of the dinosaur? In a poll of more than 1,000 workers, more than half folks said they take 30 minutes or less to eat during any given workday. 63% called the lunch hour a modern myth. A similar study in 2005 by a Michigan-based furniture company concurred, showing workers spent 14% less time breaking for lunch than they did back in 1996. This latest study, by the way, was done for Kentucky Fried Chicken, which certainly needs people to get out for lunch. Finally, as more homeowners turn to their own backyard for rest and recreation, a local company is offering an alternative to traditional slow-growing landscapes. Vegas Wallscapes can imprint any digital image on a mesh background that is then attached to walls. Founder Lloyd Ronfeld says, or says the product is a natural for the Valley's small backyards and for homeowners who don't want to wait for their landscape to mature. He says he and his wife came up with the idea searching for their own home. As we were looking, uh, we, we started talking about what we'd want in our backyard, uh, and a cinder block wall wasn't what we wanted. So we said there had to be a way uh, to change that, and that's kind of where we came up with the idea. We started looking into it, and we uh, created the business from that. People just are struck by it when they come back. They're like, wow. You know, they just can't believe it. And from inside the house coming out, it's like you're, you're not in Vegas anymore. But I am going to continue it down the rest of my, my wall and, and make the putting green look like, you know, a, a Maui um, golf course. As for maintenance, Roanfelt says the virtual landscapes can last up to 10 years, even under our desert sun. Coming up next week, right here on In Business Las Vegas, one of the largest annual trade shows for Valley Real Estate kicks off next week. What does the future hold for the local market? We'll take you inside the 16th Annual Realtors Rally next week. Read about many of the stories from today's program and much more by subscribing to our print publication. Log on to InBusinessLasVegas.com. And that is our program for this week. I'm Jeff Gillen here each week on InBusiness and each night on News 1 at 9. Thank you for watching.